All right, welcome back to the Business Workshop Podcast, where we bring all types of businesses and entrepreneurs into the shop to share their stories so we can all grow our individual businesses and help each other grow together. But first, I'm your host, Josh Handler, co-founder of the Handler Zimmerman team at Keller Williams Realty Elite. If you have a home you're looking to sell, reach out to me to help answer any questions or concerns about the process or if you're just curious what your home is worth today. If you're looking to buy, our team is here for you. Please give us a call, 516-732-6398. Now, in today's workshop, we have, as many people may call him, <laughs> Uncle Lou. Uncle Lou, CFP, <laughs> Lou Soriano in the building. We're going to talk everything about what you need to do to be set up for success today and in the future so you're not working to your 60, grinding away every peanut you need to survive. Correct. So today, Lou Soriano is in the workshop. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Josh, for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, listen, I'm always honored to kick it with you and like chop it up a little bit. And I'm digging the new uh, the new setup. You here, are man. the first official guest. In oh the no, new kidding! Setup. Now I'm really honored. So I was honored. honored to begin with, but now <laughs> this is like taking it to another level. So thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Sure. So we always talk about it. Obviously, for anybody that doesn't know, I use you for my personal stuff. Yes. So I, he is the best. Period. Thank you, bro. I went through a lot of people, <laughs> and this is where we ended up. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know strictly investing in general, right? Yeah, it's it's tough. It's a tough topic to really figure out and yes. wrap your head around. So what do you see? We'll, we'll kind of stay in the entrepreneur space if you're a realtor, a loan officer, something okay. that you kind of work for yourself yep. where you may not have a... Uh, of, you know your own personal 401ks and your own personal retirement funds and stuff like that yep stay on that on on that basis for okay. thinking wise all right so um first off again thanks for having me i appreciate the opportunity secondly i think before and we're, when we're talking about um independent business owners entrepreneurs people live in that 1099 life i call it um the brutal life the brutal <laughs> life of 1099 life one thing you got to get straight first is your taxes right you got to get a handle on that so I usually don't tell people to start investing or thinking about investing in retirement plans through their business. That makes sense. Till I have a handle on the taxes, bro, because you know oh, forget that it. that is another bear in and of itself. And uh, we're filming this like we're heading into the end of tax season. Yeah, so you've probably been going absolutely insane. Like people are getting sticker shock, the 1099ers of the world and a lot of the realtors I work with because they didn't pay quarterly. You know, this is a whole nother topic to, in and of itself. I used to be like that. I, obviously, you know, but mm -hmm. I never used to pay quarterly. I used to pay whatever fines that were associated yeah. with it and pay everything at once and be like, oh, you owe 35000 now. I'm like, yeah. Oh, great. And that's you and know? this is what happens as in the beginning, it doesn't matter so much because, you know, you're just starting out, you're making X amount, you're writing off your deductions and all this other stuff. And then it's it's manageable, right? right? Yeah. Or maybe you don't any owe any tax at all. As you start to become more successful, that's not the case. Yeah. There's only so much <laughs> shit you can write off, yep. right? Like, let's be honest. You got your car and your mileage and your, you know, your and dues and things your like gas that. And your basic stuff. And then it, after a while, you don't have $100,000 of expenses, right? right? Being a realtor, especially, is kind of low overhead in, in some respects. So, my first uh, thing is let's handle that. Make sure you got your taxes handled. Once you do, then let's talk about what to do to reduce your taxable income by using retirement plans through right. your business. So, so to start off, being set up the correct way is number one. Yes. Right? So when is it time to start opening a corporation? So on a, as a realtor, for example, uh -huh. since a lot of people that are going to be realtors listening, when is the correct time to set up some type of corporation? And then mm -hmm. what's the differences or what type of corporations they should yeah. really be looking into? I guess it's probably the number one question yeah. you get asked. So I do. And you, you're asking good questions. And by the way, I saw your video last week with the retirement plans. And, the, and I was actually and I'm upset. Like, I'm like, this Josh is stealing my thunder now. Like he's, he's I like, shouted you out on it and they cut that part out. I oh, I didn't upset. care about that part. I thought you did a great <laughs> job. I shared it right away. I was like, my man, he's, he's got it all down. Uh, but as far as when uh, to be structured... Um, something other than a sole proprietor. Yeah. So, so like, yeah. So when you're a ten, when you're a ten ninety nine, and I'm going to use a realtor as an yeah, example because yeah. I work with so many and and many people follow you, right? <laughs> so if you're a realtor, you're just starting out. I would say until you start netting, meaning after expenses, uh, once you start netting forty, fifty thousand dollars, maybe that's when you want to start considering. That's a sweet spot. Yeah, to be structured as an S corp, and there's reasons for that. So. I would say anything uh, less than forty thousand dollars, 
you probably find as a sole proprietor. Once you start getting over fifty, sixty thousand dollars net income, you want to be an S corp. And if you're somewhere in between, meaning like between, let's say, call forty and fifty, maybe an LLC. And I'll explain the differences why. So in the beginning, just be an S corp. Don't go setting up LLCs and, and S corps unnecessarily. There's an added expense to do that. Right. Um, and there's also requirements. You got to do filings quarterly. Your accounting fees are going to go up. So that's why I say wait until it makes sense <laughs> wait till you have to. where the fee you're going to pay an extra accounting is going to offset the taxes that you owe. Right. And then if you're somewhere in between, being an LLC makes sense, Josh, because you could always retroactively be treated as an S corp in a given year um, that you're not sure. So let's say I'm a realtor. I netted 40,000 last year. I'm hoping to do better this year, but I don't know. Right. I don't want to set up an S corp, pay extra accounting fees and all this other stuff. I'll just be an LLC. But once I start getting to October, November, and I realize, Oh shit, I made $80,000 of yeah, net yeah, yeah. income or whatever. <laughs> then I call my accountant and say, Hey, listen, let's, make the S corp election where I could control my self employment oh, so taxes. Can start as an LLC and then kind of transfer yes. over to. Yeah. So okay. that's the only time I tell people to do that because you don't want that sticker shock. You know, once the year is over, it's, you can't do that. Right. So that's, that's kind of like my breakdown of when to be a sole proprietor LLC and an S corp. Okay. So once they start their S corps, for example, yep. so they start their S corps, they open it up. So now they're going to start using some type of QuickBooks or something mm -hmm. of that nature filing all their deductions, et cetera, right? Yep. So the benefits of why people should use an S Corp compared to just always staying, you know, sole, sole, proprietor. sole proprietor, what's the main benefits other than taxes, if, if there's yeah. any others, that people should really be focusing on okay. opening up a corp? Okay, so the number one thing is uh, self-employment taxes. So that's why you want to be an S Corp when it makes sense, guys. So um, just to be clear, there's really three types of taxes you pay when you are a 1099 um, business owner. Right. You pay federal tax, we all do. You pay state tax, we all do. But you also pay self-employment tax, right. which is FICA, which is your Medicare, Social Security. That, guys, is 15.3%. So just using an easy example, $100,000. If you're not making $100,000, don't worry. Something to look Doesn't forward matter. to. <laughs> Something to look forward to or just cut my numbers in half, but it's a, a number I could use without you uh, needing a calculator. If you make $100,000, you got to pay 20% federal tax, let's say, right? Uh, somewhere between 15 and 20. Um, you got to pay 5% state, and then you got to pay 15% for FICA tax. It gets us in New York. <laughs> so that's 15000 And that's if you, your net, by right. the way, is 100000 right, right. not your gross. So if your net is that. So that's a lot. You add that up, it's like, oh, you know, that's like thirty, forty thousand yeah, dollars $40,000 in taxes. <laughs> exactly. When you're an S-corp, though, you could control that a little more, that uh, self-employment tax. You could say, I made 100000 I'm going to pay myself a salary, W-2. Let's call it $40,000. Um, and then the rest is just a distribution, which is reported on a K-1. I don't want to bore everybody. You only have to pay self-employment tax on the 40, on the salary part. On the distribution I'm describing, you just pay federal and state. On the salary, the 40000 in this example, again, you pay federal, state, self-employment. Right, so that's basically so all pay, the profit after the salary. Correct. You give yourself a distribution, you're not paying on that. Right, you're not paying self-employment tax, fifteen percent right. on sixty grand. You're just paying. Your, Do the, the math. The state, you'll see that's significant. State and federal. Correct. Got it. Correct. So that is not subjected to self-employment tax. So you can save easily, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars if you're netting a hundred thousand um, dollars. You're netting fifty. You know, just right. cut everything in half. <laughs> <laughs> you get the idea. Right. But that's when it makes sense, and it also makes sense to be um, structured as an S corp or an LLC. For some other reasons, um, one liability, right? right? So you have some liability. I'm old enough to remember when realtors put you in the car and drove you around. You guys don't Everybody, do that anymore, right? I've never seen a realtor actually drive around when I first started, like five uh -huh. years ago. People were like, "Oh, do you drive around your clients?" So I was like, "No, not even a client even asks." Like everybody just no. expects, like, "I'll meet you at the house," like, and then we're driving to the next one. Like, there's uh -huh. no hop in my car and be a taxi driver. Dude, and quick, quick, funny story. I was a realtor once, and it was because a realtor put me in their car. And here's the story, right? <laughs> they put me in the car. They said, we're going to show you some houses. Me and my wife are in this car. We literally were, like, kidnapped. <laughs> we looked at 10 or 15 houses. Every house we drove up to the curb, we knew we didn't like right away. 
And they said, no, you got to see it because like the homeowner's expecting us to show we're you the house. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit. So we're going in and out of these houses. I says, you know what? I'm going to find out how hard is it to be a realtor. I'm going to take the test and then I could just go and do this myself. Right. Which I did. Became a realtor. Was with Century 21 back in 1995. And the first house I ever bought uh, was the one that like, you know, I sold. I was like the, the customer and the agent. Right. Gotcha. Okay. That was the end of my real estate career because I knew how hard it was to be a realtor. Easy to become a realtor, like I said before. Uh, Very hard to make a living doing it. I respect what you guys do tremendously. It's Uh, super hard, but they make it, honestly, they make it too easy. It shouldn't be $100 in 75 hours. That's why they have 40,000 licenses out there that do no business. It's like, make it 1,000, make it $2,000 for the course. Make it, you know... 200 hours, make it 300 hours. So it actually means something when you get it. Mm -hmm. And maybe you'll actually learn something other than like that. You can't like air rights, like that nobody cares about like on Long Island. It's like, how about we learn like how to fill out like a sales binder and actually become a realtor because you don't learn anything that you need to do. In the actual course. Right. So it's like, you make it so you easy. Know, you learn but, enough to pass a test. Yeah, you pass right? the test so they can collect their $600 from you every year. Yeah. So they're making their $18 million a year, but you literally <laughs> have no idea what you're doing in real estate. So it's like... Well, my profession is similar in a sense that you got to take tests to get licensed, right? But then we have designations. Like I'm a CFP, Certified Financial Planner. I'm also an enrolled agent. That's a, de- a designation issued by the IRS. You could be a CPA. You could be a CFA. So I, I think uh, the real estate industry would benefit from having designations. And I know you guys do they, they to do, some but degree. All but That's all after the fact. Yeah. And well, with license. us too, it's after. Right. But anyway, we're digressing. Yeah. Let's stay on course with the business <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so back on course. So they open up their S-Corp. So now they're giving themselves a salary. Yes. So in the beginning, I never gave myself a salary. Mm-hmm. Right. So what's the downside of not giving yourself a salary on payroll, for example? Excellent question. Love then it. actually putting yourself on payroll because in the beginning, I didn't do that at all. And I know there's some fines associated with not paying mm-hmm. along the way, which yeah. I ended up always paying. Yeah. And just because I was like, oh, I want to keep the money liquid. I want to be able to use it. I want to be able to use it. So I like I never did payroll. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the year, I would just eat the bullet eat it. and right. whatever I owe, I owe. Yeah. But what's the benefits of really having yourself on as an employee compared to not. So I just want to compliment you and I'm not saying it because I'm here with you and you're a client of mine, (laughs) but the reality is this guys, um, you've done a lot of good things in the past year or two. And it's not just like with what we set up with your retirement plan, you have a CPA who I work with your accountant. So you, you're building a team of people around you so you could plan now for the future. And that's something I would advise everybody to do if you're self-employed. Um, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> right. And uh, what are the, so first of all, when you're an S Corp, it's a requirement to take a reasonable salary. What's a reasonable salary? Well, it depends on your profession, right? Uh, if you're a realtor, you could look and see, like there are websites that you could see what the average realtor earns and it, let's call it thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, whatever it is. Right. That could be your reasonable salary. So if you make $100,000, you could cut yourself a W-2 for 30, 40,000. Got it. And the IRS would accept that as a reasonable salary. The rest would be a distribution. Um, paying quarterly taxes is important too. So you don't have to pay everything all at the end of the year. And it also is a requirement to file quarterly when you're an S corporation because you have to pay your FICA taxes. And again, we're talking about Social Security. Um, we're talking about uh, your Medicare, and we're talking about uh, New York State unemployment. So when you're breaking up your payments quarterly, mm-hmm. so obviously you don't know what you're going to make at the end of the year because we're not salaried employees, right? Right. That's so, why you want to keep your salary low in so the beginning. You, so you keep your salary at, say, the 20, 30, 40,000, whatever it may be, and you're going to pay your taxes on your employee as your employee, right? Correct. Like, uh, yep. And then your quarterly taxes for the business you're basing it off an average of w- or what you think you may come down to or... Correct. So this is why it's important to talk with your accountant year round. If you are only talking to your accountant at the end of the year, you're seeing your guy or your girl, whoever your accountant is, to have your taxes prepared. If you want to have tax planning, you got to do that throughout the year. Right. So there's a difference between tax preparation, tax planning. Tax planning all year long, tax preparation... Uh, January to April, (laughs) you drop your stuff off and he sees you in two weeks and tells you the damage. Um, So tax planning is, it's like, hey, it's June, it's July, I'm halfway through the year, I'm doing better now than I did this time last year, I think I'm going to have a tax problem. Let me call my accountant. 
So you could adjust your estimates based on that. Or if you already know what you think you're going to make give this year, give or take, you could just have that preset. Now, is it better to overshoot it or undershoot it? Because I know getting money back yeah. from the IRS, God bless whenever you get it, right? But yeah. they're, they're always on top of you to make sure you pay it. But oh, getting yes. it back, they'll take their sweet time. Yeah. So if you're short, is it better to be short and just make up the difference at the end? Or mm -hmm. is it better just to be on pace and if you fall short... And you, they owe you some money, then you could either roll it into the next year if it's a little bit, yeah. or you know, get your money back. What's the better route? Man, I'm telling you, it? this guy's gonna. Is this camera on me. This guy's gonna take my job. <laughs> you have a career in finance if you ever decide this real estate thing isn't working out. Only but it is. I learned from you guys because you're handling. You're putting me in the direction <laughs> where to go. So now right. I know what to ask. No, it's 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 awesome, man. I love hearing you say it. So, um, is it better to overshoot or undershoot? Honestly, um, if you're a 1099, you're just starting out and you're getting to the point where S Corp makes short, I say undershoot a little bit okay. and just pay the difference at the end. Why? You need the money. You need the money to live off of. Now you're paying quarterly taxes. You're paying an accountant. You're setting up a retirement plan. You want to reinvest in your business, you know, things like that. So as long as it's something manageable you can handle right. at the end of the year and it's expected, fine. One thing I would just say, though, make sure you at least pay what you had to pay last, last year, year because then that'll kind of reduce or eliminate any penalties you have if there's a big shortfall. Gotcha. So at least like if, if I, oh, I paid 20 grand in taxes last year. Well, pay at least 20 grand in taxes this year. Right. Maybe a little more. But, I remember you know. the, the fine actually wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be because I, I think maybe... It's it was, not that bad. I think I was spending maybe 900 bucks or something like that uh -huh. every year for like not the penalty of not... Actually, that's paying. high, but was okay, it? maybe. Maybe it was less, but I don't remember even seeing it being, you know, somewhere in that ballpark. So I was like... Right. But still, you know, the taxes you have to pay regardless. Yeah. So if you were paying... A, so literally, I, I was giving them a $900 or $800, whatever it was, for doing what I had to do anyway. Yeah. So it's like... It's easier to do it in smaller chunks throughout the year... Um, and you know, just do it on a quarterly basis because whatever it winds up to be at the end, it'll be painless. Really, right. it really yeah. will. Um, and if you overshoot to your point, yes, you get a refund and you can apply that to the next year. And the benefit of that is, well, if you let's assume are going to make the same amount of money, maybe right. a little more, maybe a little less. Well, maybe you could even reduce the amount you pay quarterly the following year. It's like, oh, I was getting back a four thousand dollar refund. Maybe you break that up. So right. I got a thousand a quarter already yeah. applied 100%. so I could reduce what I'm paying this year. I think to me, I liked, I originally thought I liked better having a big chunk of change in the uh -huh. bank so I'll, I could use it throughout the year. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the big bullet when I, you know, at the end of the year. But honestly, this year being so far, like just paying quarterly and just seeing it come out of the account every couple months, it's it's expected. Honest, it's, it's expected and you don't have to worry at the end of the year, be like, oh shit, like I need that thirty five grand, I need that forty thousand. Like, okay, in the beginning, oh, I need that twenty grand. Like, yeah, it's still a lot of money. to yes. come up with that one shot. But if you you don't feel it as much if you're just breaking it up throughout the year. So it honestly is better off, I in my opinion, to do it. My this man, way it is than the one shot deal. I used to think the opposite, but now no. doing it, it's honestly so much better. And so and much. and Josh, I just want to point something out because you know you're set up as an S corp. You're you're taking the next step and set up a retirement plan through your right. business. Something I'd like to talk. Yeah, we're about. gonna get into that for sure. That's on my list. All right, good. Um, <laughs> but even for people who are just starting out in real estate, and you made thirty, forty, you know, I, I did a tax return for a realtor over the weekend. Um, I want to say this realtor made about sixty thousand, sixty five thousand after deductions and everything. Okay. They still owed like six thousand dollars. Let's just call it. So you say 6,000, that's a lot. Well, it's 10% of what you right. grossed, right? Right. Um, but yeah, well, uh, she grossed 60. So oh, okay. after so, expenses and everything. Oh, so she took less. Yeah, okay. because she had federal, state, and then this 15.3% right. um, when you're a, a Schedule C sole proprietor, it's 15% additional tax. Um, but if you don't have that put away, that 7,000 is like 70,000. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, where am I going to come up with that? You know, um, whereas if you were paying that throughout the year, let's just say you were putting 1,500 a quarter, right. you know. You don't feel it as much. You don't feel it as much. It would have been 6,000 using this example. And now you do your taxes like, all right, you owe 1,000. Right. That's manageable. Well, 7,000, new realtor, that's yeah. a lot. That's the problem with, uh, you know, unfortunately, our industry, they see the big check. Mm -hmm. They're like, I just made 10 grand. And they go blow eight thousand of it, and they're like, and then <laughs> I know they don't realize this is true like, too. Nothing got put away, nothing got put away for taxes, nothing got put away for savings, nothing mm -hmm. got put away for the rainy day fund, nothing got put away towards investments for future. Like 
They just went out and bought that Gucci belt that they thought was so cool and all these materialistic things. Whatever. Listen, there's nothing wrong with liking some nice stuff. We all like we nice all like stuff. It, but put some away in each section and spend what's left. Yes. You know, you got to so, have the discipline, and that's that's the hard part. And I feel that's the number one issue why people don't do the right thing with their taxes this way, and they just spend it, and then right. they feel like, holy shit, like, I just got hit with a big number. Sticker shock. You know, it's like, holy, like, I knew it was coming, and it's still shocking. When you're not <laughs> expecting it, it got to be, it like, gets, yeah, it's it gotta like, be even and, worse. But you want to know something? So I was thinking of something else you asked me earlier I want to circle back to. But um, I think sometimes that's what discourages people from getting into um, entrepreneurship or um, starting their own business is because they do make a little bit of money. And then as soon as they do and they realize there's a tax bill associated Mm -hmm. with that because they always were W-2 and that was all done for them, it discourages them when you say, hey, you owe seven, ten grand. It's like, well, I don't have that. You know what? This isn't for me. I just want a job where this is taken care of for me. Same is true with, um, you know, investing. People say, uh, oh, I heard about whatever, the next hottest thing. A couple of years ago, it was all cannabis stocks. Past couple of years, it's all crypto. Exactly. So they throw money into these things, don't understand anything about them. They lose their money and they say investing is not for me. That wasn't investing. That was gambling. Yeah. If you want to invest, that, you know, it takes, it time. takes time. Yeah. Just like starting a business takes time. That's a lot of people, like you said just now, like they run away from it because they get hit with this number. Same thing like when they hear, oh, I got to pay for my old health insurance. Like, yeah, but if you're making more money, you're paying for it at the same time. It all gets wrapped into your number. Yes. If you think about it. So instead of the employer paying for it and taking it out of your paycheck or whatever, you're paying it for yourself out of your own business. Or yeah. Whatever. Like, and it all is the same. It's all and, the same. And the word you use is business. If Unless you start... And, and you don't have to do all this at once, Josh, as you right. know, because it took lot. you years <laughs> to get there. And it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot to understand. It's a lot to undertake. And if you just started as a realtor or any business owner and you said, OK, I'm starting day one or year one. Right. Now I got to get these quarterly taxes I heard about and start an S Corp and a retirement plan. It's, it's not going to work. Yeah, you're Too much. Yeah. yeah. Start slow. Just start. Get your taxes in order <laughs> and understand your expenses and keep track of your expenses. After you get there. Go to the next step. What's the next step? Well, okay. Should I be structured in a way that could reduce my taxes? Right. Yes. Once you pass that, okay. I did everything I can. I'm an S corp. I'm paying quarterly. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm keeping track of expenses. I'm still paying tax. What could I do next? Right. Think about a retirement plan through your business. Think about health insurance through your business. Then once you have all these things, you really have a business. You own a business and not a job. Right. Prior to that, you just own you're a just job. A, you're an employee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a sense, you are. You, you know, own a job. Well, that's that's the thing people real you gotta realize eventually when you get to that level in real estate is yes, you are an employee, but then you're running your own business. Mm-hmm. So like you're you're an employee of your own business. So you're running right. two things. You're running yourself as an employee and you're running an umbrella of the business. Correct. So that's when you're you know, all these things that are coming to play when the offering, you know, a hundred percent. All the retirement stuff, which I want to get into because to yep. me, that's one of the biggest and most important things after you're set up properly. Yes. You're in, you're in level three right yeah. now. <laughs> we took the third step. <laughs> There's one, two, you're in the third step. Yes. So we just started doing a lot of this over the last couple months, six months, whatever it may be. I mm-hmm. don't even know. But the main benefit of, in my opinion, of putting yourself on payroll rather than doing the right thing and paying quarterly and paying all this stuff. Now you're set up properly and yep. not dealing with it. The main benefit to me is. Okay, if I open up a 401k now for myself through the business, now, okay, if I, if I claimed $40,000 in income, if I put 20000 of that into the 401k, all right, you just, saved on 20, 20. You're, you just saved 20k in taxes. Yes. And you just, you just put away 20000 for retirement. So it's like that stuff I think is like the biggest yeah. upside on taxes and no, nothing gets better than compounding interest. So it's like- a hundred percent. Put it away, put it away, put it away, which I wish I knew when I was like 25. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't matter, but, but we're not going back. We're not Josh. going back. We're, we're going, going forward. forward. <laughs> we're going forward, baby. You know this stuff now. And then, you know, uh, I just want to add to that and something that take you implemented away. without putting all your business out there, oh, right? Take it away. You hire an employee through your business. And if that, em- if that employee happens to be your spouse, you put her on payroll too. Shannon does the best QuickBooks. She's my, quick- there you she, go. She runs my QuickBooks. So she's an employee. Listen, books are important to keep whether you're starting from day one. My recommendation to anybody listening is to have a separate bank account for your business, for Absolutely. your commission. That's number one. If you're not doing that, you're already kind of hustling backwards in my opinion. So you got to have a separate bank account for that. But when you get to level three, like what we're talking about, 
yeah, set up a retirement plan for yourself. Um, and then if you are, um, if you have a spouse, if you have a child, you know, you could put them on payroll too. There's yeah, so, so many things you can do once you get up that. There. What's the rule? Mm-hmm. I know there's some type of rule where, okay, I've opened up a corporation. Um, so I opened my corporation. I have a 401k, right? Right. So my 401k, I'm on it as an employee. Mm-hmm. And then you're allowed to put your spouse or, or you could have one person also before you have to make it like this gigantic. Uh, yeah. So issue. it depends on the plan. You have a solo 401k. Okay. And I'd like to talk at some point briefly about the difference between a SEP and a, mm-hmm. and a solo 401k. Solo 401k, as the name implies, is just for one person. Unless that other employee is your spouse. Once you get past that, then yeah, solo 401k doesn't work. And you have to have a 401k like, you know, any other corporation would would have. And then there are, yeah, there are rules there. If they're employees, how you have to include them in the plan and how much they could contribute. And you as the employer match to that if you decide to match. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So you open up the 401k. So I have like for me, I have my myself. As an employee, my wife is an employee. And we got Shannon on there. We got Shannon, right? So we both have, we have two employees as businesses. They're getting paid. They both get paid, you know, a salary, for Mm -hmm. example. And we're putting most of that into the 401k, right? Right. So now we're saving on taxes, but you're putting money into retirement and you're, you're still showing it. You're still paying. The government's still getting paid. Everybody's happy. Yes. And you're, and you're saving on the back end. So it's a win-win. Everyone's really happy. It's, it is win-win. And um, the other thing too is just using again, this hypothetical hundred thousand dollar scenario um and you're an s corp if you pay yourself like you said forty thousand dollars you could take 20 of that almost and put it in there but it gets even better if it's a solo 401k compared to a sep a sep is a a self-employed pension plan and the amounts you could put in there are limited to 20 percent of net income if you are a schedule c sole proprietor 25 percent if you are an s corp so for a hundred thousand it's going to be twenty thousand or twenty five thousand and that's it but when you're um, using a solo 401k, you could put 20000 of salary in there. So that's going to be twenty, And then you could have an employer match, of which right, is right. 25% of okay, salary. salary. So you could get, you know, a lot more into a solo 401k than you can accept, number one. Number two, there's a Roth version of it that you don't get with ASEP. Maybe you want a Roth version. I won't right. get into the Roth Look it up. Google it. <laughs> Google But you could have a Roth solo 401k. Right. Um, and you could also take a loan against a solo 401k, uh, which you can't do with a SEP. So there's a lot more. The, the SEP is becoming antiquated. The reason why people use SEP in the past, it was the only plan that after the tax filing deadline or uh, that you could set up um, before the tax filing deadline. So again, $100,000. I sit with my accountant. You owe X amount. It's like, oh, man, is there anything else I could do? It's like, no, we wrote off everything else. It's like, yeah, but I still have some money. Like, there's got to be something. Right. Yeah, there's a thing called a SEP. If you put 10, 20 grand in there, we could deduct that too. Gosh. That was the only plan you could set up after the calendar year up to the tax filing deadline plus okay. extensions. Gotcha. But you could do the same thing with four, uh, solo 401k now. So there's no real advantage of a SEP in my opinion. So I'll just leave that there. More people are going towards the solo 401k 100%, route. yes. I'll, and it's nice to be able to, because, okay, if, if you could afford it and everything's are good, like if you put in 20000 whatever the max is that you put in 401k these days, 20000 uh, nineteen five right. and change, so yeah. Say I'm going to keep it 20, keep numbers easy. So yeah, say 20. you throw in 20, say you claimed 40000 on salary, you're putting 20000 in, and then you could add another 5% on top of that, and you could throw it in. You're going to pay it in taxes anyway. You might as well deduct it. You pay know, yourself. Pay yourself and save it for later. Right now, speaking of paying yourself, because I think we spoke about this once before. Okay. What is your feeling on people that do borrow against themselves? Okay. I know like in the 401k, you can borrow against yourself and you pay yourself back with interest. Yes. So it's like, okay, I mean, if I'm going to borrow from someone you want to borrow, I guess you might as well borrow from yourself if you're going to have to pay somebody interest on it. Mm-hmm. Pay it to yourself. Right. What's your aspect on that? Because obviously once you pull that money out, you're, you're taking it from the market, right? You're, yeah. If you're not, if you can make eight or ten percent in the market, mm-hmm. and you're taking it out to pay yourself whatever five percent interest, whatever the rate is, whatever. What's the? Is there a real benefit to it? Listen, full stop. I'm gonna say I am not a fan of borrowing from retirement plans. Full stop. Like, just don't do it. It has to be like your last, in case of emergency, break glass. Like that's <laughs> when you do this kind of thing. However, we did have that situation in 2020, right? Pandemic hit, people are out of work. People there were money. people, people needed money. They weren't making money. 
that may be one of those situations, right? That's the emergency break glass. That's the emergency break glass. And then you pay yourself back with interest. Don't take a distribution. Take out a loan. There's a big oh, difference. There's two different ways. Oh, to take yeah. It out. Oh, okay. If you take out a distribution, fully taxable. And if you're under 59 and a half, you're, you're going to get hit with a penalty of 10% on the withdrawal. If you take out a loan, it's not a taxable event as long as you pay yourself back. With interest. Okay. If you quit that job or you got fired, I'm talking about people who have a nine to five. Right, right. Whatever the balance is becomes taxable. But for the most part, it's not if, taxable. If you get fired or you quit your job that, you know, say, say I was, uh, I don't know, I worked for an elevator company. I was yep. making X amount. I had, a, I had my 401k. I quit. I go real estate now. I open up my own business. I could transfer that 401k to a new 401k free without or, paying any. Or an IRA. Yeah, you could roll it over to an IRA. IRA. Yeah. You can't open up like a, your own solo 401k and dump it into that. You can. Oh, yes, you can. you can do that okay. as well. But one other thing I wanted to point out, Josh, about 2020 was uh, there were a lot of people with S corporations and people who were Schedule C. And I'm going to use realtors because I work with so mm -hmm. many of them. They applied for PPP loans and couldn't get them. I was, I was one of them. Oh, okay. So here's why you didn't, didn't get, get it. Here's, here's why you <laughs> may not have gotten it. If you're an S corporation, like I said earlier, you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. Right. So if you weren't on payroll and you weren't paying yourself a reasonable salary, even if it was $20,000, yeah. you up. couldn't apply for PPP because you didn't pay. Yep. It, it's the Paycheck Protection Program. If you're not paying yourself <laughs> a paycheck, you meaning protected. <laughs> you, you're not going to be protected by yep. PPP. And then even with the Schedule C filers, if you're putting your um, commission checks in with your, you know, let's say you have another job or you just have all your money in one account, you weren't eligible for PPP either because right, they couldn't account. distinguish what was your business income. And let's, right. again, use commissions as an example. Yeah. Like keep that separate. Then they could see and those people who did we're eligible. So these are other reasons. I, I, listen, I hope we never have to use PPP 100%. or have anything like yeah, we did yeah. in 2020. But plenty of people did. And but here are reasons where this comes back to bite you if you didn't set it up right. Oh, that's that's what comes down. You know, that was like another eye opener that really wanted me. Like, I wasn't. I would have got peanuts regardless. You know, from what they were going to give me anyway. Mm -hmm. But it really was just more of the eye opener of like, okay, let's get things situated the correct way and look right. future as well, rather than okay, yes, I have my money, like, okay, just sitting in the bank account, whatever, that's not helping us, like, let's put it to where we can, Right. Let, like, let's do the right thing, and start looking Dude. retirement stuff, which is, I think, overlooked a lot in this industry. And I'm going to tell you something, so I talk to a lot of people, I never mention you by name, but now since it's out here, <laughs> it's out in the I'm going to say, listen, you don't believe me, talk to Josh, and the reason why I say that, Josh, and this is a compliment to you, is you really are forward thinking. You're thinking about these things. You're not living just in the present and you're going to be successful. Guarantee you, we're going to watch this 10 years later, five years later. And it's because you have all these things in place. And this is the other thing I want to mention too. somebody like me. Um, and there are many financial planners, CPAs, mm -hmm. a CPA is somebody who's going to specialize in your taxes. CFP maybe could do your taxes and in your investments, but it's good to have both. 100%. Maybe you want your CPA to just focus 100% on your taxes, your CFP focus on your investments. But we like working with each other, just like you agents like working with each right. other. Yeah. And you like working with lenders. I like having relationships with CPAs and they like having relationships with me. And I tell them right off the bat, like when it came to working with your CPA, James, I says, listen, I'm not looking for Josh as a tax client. I already right. told him like I, I have yeah. too many, I'm, you know, but let's work together to get this retirement plan and hear how this is. Here's how it's going to help him mm -hmm. on his taxes. He loved it because listen, as accountants, we want yeah. all legal as many legal yeah. deductions 100%. as possible <laughs> yeah. and do all that stuff the right way. So it was win-win. So yeah, build a team as you start making more money and, and, and doing that's well. what I think the biggest thing is it's, you know, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Like, I'm not the smartest person in the room, but I'll hire the smartest people that I think are in their room, mm -hmm. right? So you, you build, like you said, you build that team around you. Okay, yeah. I need a good CFP that, you know, we found that guy. You know, we need a, an accountant. Okay, yep. we got you, this guy. Yep. Like, now we know, okay, what has to be taken care of? So now you're just surrounding yourself with the people that have your best interest. Yep. And then you figure out which way you want to take it. Yep. But if you're kind of out in the open, like, uh, that's why I like the podcasting because so many people before you started doing all your clips, they had no idea about half the stuff I, and, and they still don't, but and, now and that's why I something. love, yeah. And I love doing it for that reason. Um, I don't know, like 2020 changed my life too. 
you know, I never did anything like this. My business was just based off of my own clients, word of mouth. And then like this whole thing like happened, man. happened and it's been good. But my son also is a realtor, as you know. So I started going in and talking to him and his team. And then just kind of snowballed from there. We just threw a great event. North Shore Young Professionals, the first time I went, giving them the shout out. Great time, great charity Thank organization you. that they ran. Um, next time we run one, make sure you're there. It was great. Yes, it was. But And thanks for mentioning that. They they raised over 23000 yeah, for life's awesome. work. Um, awesome. So shout out North Shore Young Professionals, Justin great. Soriano. Yeah, they were good. But um, yeah, you're going to be a dangerous client, though. And I'm going to tell you why. Because you're you're inquisitive and you're learning and you got, now you're going to get to the point where you're going to be questioning me and James like, Oh, you guys doing this, doing that. But obviously we're going to be that's covering all bases. Some loopholes and yeah, be yeah. Like, oh, what if I put this here? <laughs> right. And right. Do that there? And yeah. Like, oh, maybe but, I can save a little here. Like I said, I posted, I saw your video last week and I was like, wow, this guy is really, he's getting it. He's grasping it. And now you're sharing this information, yeah, which is know, awesome. Too. I was, I'm thankful for learning from you guys and like taking those steps. So like now for the people that don't learn it, like, I want them to mm-hmm. see how they can be set up the correct way and all future, you know, yeah, making, you know, $10,000 commission check two yep. times a month is great. But if you're not doing the right thing with it, it's just a check. And everything is cyclical. Every business is cyclical. Every, you know, I don't know how to put it. So it's important to have that money set aside for that. And, yeah. and you know, you'll be, you'll be successful in the long run if you start doing that. Yeah, I think on. the biggest thing for agents that are doing volume, you know, and I'm Listen, $100,000, and if any full-time realtor, if you bust your ass, you can make $100,000. Yes. It's not hard, especially with this market. I mean, it could be hard in this market. Right. But, you know, that's a good number to be making, and if you're making that, that's that's substantial. Where, like, 100%. You, sh- you should have plenty to really put away, have set up the right way, and start thinking future. Mm-hmm. And then have some – there's nothing wrong with spending cash, but have your spending cash, have your investment stuff, so now, like, you could – Put into some stocks if you wanted to have some mutual funds. Correct. Get into all that stuff where you know you're just adding to everything else that you have, and so what correct. Happens? And and just to put um, like you know a dot on this, if you're making a hundred thousand dollars, ten ninety nine, it's almost like making a hundred thirty, hundred forty thousand if you had a job because they take all that off you know right. for taxes and mm-hmm. your health insurance. But one thing I want to point out to the people who have a job, who are listening. Consider having a side business as well. Everything we're talking about does not just apply. Like if you, and that's how I started my business. I had a full time job. I was a biomedical engineer. I was in, you know, all all kind of things, but I always had my side business. So you're able to write off things. You're able to open up some of these plans we're talking about and take advantage of the benefits of being self employed too. You You can can do both. You can do both, which is what I think a lot of people also don't realize that. You can have a side business. Listen, it could be a small side business. It doesn't have to yes. be a gigantic business that you're doing nine to five every day also. Yep. But it'll allow you to then write off stuff through that business while you have your full-time job as well. As long as it makes sense, you're good. Whatever to you got to do. Right? We live on Long Island, bro. It's expensive. expensive as hell. You got to do whatever you got to do to, to, you know, make it's, it happen. It's cr- it's honestly, I was just, we're looking in Florida. We're looking to expand into Florida. So we've uh-huh. been going back and forth flying to Florida. Awesome. And it's just wh- what you can get down there. It, it, it it's mind blowing. Plus, you save another nine percent, whatever the state taxes, whatever. Yeah, you save. state taxes. So you save huge. another nine percent once you, you know you're living there full time or whatever. It's just like, it's it's just. So crazy. we're gonna see the uh, Handler Zimmerman team in Florida. Is that yeah. what we're saying? Is yeah. this like breaking news going on right now? It's or? been out for a little bit. Okay. But, um, okay. We've been so we're flying down looking for a house because I've been flying down like two times a month, every other month. Nice. And we've just been going and then. Um, Congrats, bro! So it's a lot of stuff. It's in awesome. It's a lot of stuff in the works, but. Uh, the goal is to eventually be able to stay there more than uh-huh. New York. And I could see why. <laughs> yeah. I mean, weather's better. And which Florida just introduced to their school system, I don't know if you saw, that they're making a mandatory class to graduate. You have to take an, a, a class on managing a checkbook, accounting. Oh, really? Um, entre- so, that's, entrepreneur that's, stuff. Like, that you, nobody, credit card, like stuff nobody speaks about. That is one of the biggest things in life. That is so awesome. Learn. It's mandatory now in Florida that they just passed. That's awesome. And awesome. and you remind me of something too. We all consume a lot of social media and there's people on social media all the time talking about financial hacks and mm-hmm. this and that. That's the one great thing I love too about social media is the content that people are putting out there in my space, financial planners, accountants, insurance agents, mm-hmm. so forth. However, like don't take the shortcut guys. A lot of times some of these things are 
like financial advice disguised as, well, I got a course to sell you yeah. or a book to sell you or it's some sort of scam. What even. Was it, the, the big thing was the G-Wagon. You could write it off. It's always These are the kind season. of things. Yeah, <laughs> these are the kind of things that I'm talking about. So, yeah, there's little nuggets of truth to these things, but, you know, you got to dig a little deeper and just don't go kind of like you off the cuff it. doing these things because you saw it on TikTok or Instagram reel. Well, that's the thing. They're comparing themselves to somebody that may make $5 million a year and you're making 100000 You mm-hmm. They have different things that they it's need to be It's a whole nother thing. Right. It's a whole nother thing. So, yeah, it might work for a very, very small percentage of people, like right. less than 5%. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> right. God bless, you know, but it's not for everybody. So be careful about, you know, um, some of the things you do, you speak with somebody before you do that kind of stuff. Well, listen, I took up plenty of your time today. I loved it. Um, I just, where's everybody follow you, mm-hmm. get a hold of you. If they have more questions or they want to set up a 401k or they want to get that whole ball rolling, with sure. the fi- you know, financing, etc. How do they call you? Where do they find you? Okay. Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Um, you could call me directly 631-236-5842. Um, and I'm on Instagram a lot. So if you want to support me on there, I like using support other than follow only because Support's a nice one support. If yeah. you want to support me on Instagram, you can follow or support me at Lou Soriano one Lou Soriano one. Yeah. So guys definitely give him a support, not a follow us. There you go. I like, it. um, <laughs> he puts out a lot of good content. I've learned a lot, which got me to where I'm now. And then you just snowball that into more knowledge. So definitely give him a, support and let him show you how you can get to that next level. Um, reach out to him with any questions. He's great at it. And I'm not just saying that I actually use him. So I really support it. Thank you. Um, again, if you have any questions, concerns about the real estate market, give me a call 516-732-6398 till the next workshop. That's a wrap.